<clears throat> Hello today. We will be talking about the connection of Italy and Iran through cinema, which is an overlook on the influence of neorealist ideas on the new wave Iranian cinema. This report was originally done <clears throat> in 2015. Hope you enjoy it. And no need to worry, it's going to be done in English. Since this was actually done for an English and an Italian course, however, the majority of the people spoke English. And of course, the history of the cinema in the past to 1925. Now, the directors of all cinema have met roadblocks despite their location of origin. Italy had a deal with the fascist regime not wanting to have the directors present the truth about what was going on in Italy. They wanted to stay in the actual past, like Dante Alighieri. Now, of course, a shift in politics changes the landscape of the film. And of course, with the fall of the fa of fascist Italy, much more of these films are starting to get sent out. And as you know, censorship can come from ideologies, government, and religion. You can actually see this in one film called Cinema Paradiso, where you have a priest actually looking at a film and every time he sees something offensive, especially if it's in his mind against the church, he would actually ring a bell and you, and the person operating the, the reels would have to put an actual card in between that to take it out. Now, the New Wave movement began in Persian cinema during the late 1960s. The main progress points of the films are the poetic dialogue, which is similar to Pasolini's films, the allegorical storytelling that is similar to La Strada, El Posto, the La Strada means the street, the postal means the, the job, and of course the great life. Some of these progress points of the films are political issues, which is in a film called La Nota de San Lorenzo, which means the night of St. Lawrence. Of course, when that film came to the United States, it was translated to Night of the Shooting Stars. Some of these progress points may deal with philosophical issues, which is similar to Ladri de Bicicleta, Bicycle Thief or Bicycle Thieves, Red Desert. Now, just so you know that the pre-Islamic culture of Persia was about the freedom of life. Examples of this can be seen in movies like 300, which 300 in itself is not historically accurate compared to the actual story of the real 300 and also the stories of Arabian Nights. And of course, there's also hints of the culture that are present in Disney movies of Aladdin, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. That's probably one of the best examples I could think of at the moment, actually. Except if you look at Mulan, you'll notice that actual Disney makes a very cleaned up version of it. If you want, you can actually take a look at some other actual channels here on YouTube that talk about that. Because Aladdin, when you look at the description of it, it's about a Baghdad prince. And it's Baghdad, Iraq. Or Iraq. Now we're going to look at some visual symbols, which were commonplace, especially during the beliefs in Zoroastrianism. The art in this these films would tell a story and have a plot with subplots. In a way, the style was like a modern-day storyboard used for films. And of course, the first theater in Iran was opened in 1904 by Mirza Ibrahim. And with this video on here, I can't see the actual last name. Now, the first film school was in 1925 in Parvarish Gahe Artistic Style Cinema. Now we're going to talk about the influence of neorealism and the demographics of the films. The topics of social depravity and grief along the political strife were the markers of what sparked the Iranian directors to look at the film, films of Fellini, that's Federico Fellini and Vittorio De Sica. Now be mindful that the directors were in a constant battle with, with the state and with one another. They had to find ways to tell stories that were often censored by clerics. And of course, I mentioned earlier, look at the film. Cinema Paradiso. 
Of course, the freedom to act out of the struggle of society in an environment that propelled the idea that everything was fine, when in truth, the society was a fragment of stone. Which means that the truth wasn't getting told that they wanted everything to seem all right. They didn't want the truth to get out there. And as we know, that scenes in the films were based in nature and not in a studio like most Hollywood films. You'll see this in La Chita Perta, which means the open city. You can see the backdrop of St. Peter's Basilica in that movie, and that's, you can't get great shots like that in the studio. That was done all on set within Italy. And of course, the shots were similar to neorealism in regards to the time that long takes. And just to let you know that a lot of these actors in the film, they're not professional actors. Probably the most professional you would get is someone by the name of Anthony Quinn. I'm not for sure if it was the same Anthony Quinn as we know in other films. And he would also have Sophia Loren in some films. And just so you know, the protagonists in these movies were of the lower or rural classes. And a lot of these endings were open and led to debate. Which means they were quite the opposite of they lived happily ever after. Look at the film, of course, The Bicycle Thieves. That film, there's so much plots and subplots and philosophical points in there that some of the directors today would actually have a hard time discussing the films. The only one who probably does that to a great magnitude would be Colin Trevorrow. You'll probably know him from the new Jurassic World. And here's where we come up with more of the actual Iranian cinema. From what we know about Iran, it's not actually positive. We always hear about the negativity of Iran. Well, I'm going to give you some interesting points that might actually open your eyes here to realize that what we hear in the actual media itself is not necessarily true. But in regards when Mohammed Reza Shah Pahlavi came to power, the director saw this as an opportunity to employ the ideas of Western cinema. Most he noted was Italian neorealism and French cinema. I have a background in a viewing Italian neorealist cinema. I don't have a background in French cinema. However, I thought that was actually quite interesting. Now, many groups felt that he was promoting Western ideals at the expense of the Islamic way of life. Ayatollah Khomeini held this belief. And this is actually a quote from Khomeini himself. The radio, the television, the print media, the theaters, and the cinemas have been successfully used to intellectually anesthetize nations, especially the youth. Television films are the product of either Western or Eastern countries tending to lead the young generation and men and women away from the healthy business of life, work and industry, and production and learning, and plunge them into a world of self-estrangement or disrespect for and mistrust of everything native, including their country and even their culture, and their artifacts, many of which were taken to museums and libraries in the Western and Eastern Bloc countries. Here's another one made by Khomeini in 1979 and also by an, another person named Red John in 2000. We, were, we are not opposed to a cinema, to radio, or to television. What we oppose is vice and the use of the media to keep our young people in the state a backwardness and dissipate their energies. We have never opposed these features of modernity in themselves, but when they are brought from Europe to the East, particularly to Iran, Unfortunately, they were not used to advanced civilization, but in order to drag us into barbarism. The cinema is a modern invention that ought to be used for the sake of educated people, but as you know, it was used to corrupt our youth. It is a misuse of the cinema that we are opposed to, a misuse caused by the treacherous policies of our rulers. Now, it's interesting. He says that in 1979, by 1989, he almost had like a different belief where he was not liking it. After 10 years, what changed during those 10 years? 
Because if you look at the film industry itself, what was so bad? But or not, we're going to be getting to that and actually a film in this actual presentation. So just so you know, President Hojato Lesalam Mohammed Katami, before he became president, was put in charge of the film industry. Under him, the import of foreign films was severely limited. Now, what they consider foreign films, to us here in the West, we would consider them just films. We would consider films from Iran as being actually imported. Now, the directors would have used this to their advantage to oppose their regime. Understand that the directors in Iran, the film directors, they wanted to actually oppose the regime. According to the media that we were seeing, is that all the people in Iran did not care for the Western cultures. But these directors are using this stumbling block to their advantage. And what happened, it ended up being a popular tactic employed by the early pioneers and in turn made the films come into the spotlight abroad. Let's say one of my slides skipped on there. So, the shifting gears movement of the directors, it was with the directors Abdul Karim Sarush and Mohsen Makhmabath. They saw that religion and art could not be contained in a straitjacket of ideology. Think about someone telling you that you cannot do what you like because they do not like it. Within the United States and a lot of Western countries, this is an infringement on speech. And the United States is a freedom of speech and that is guaranteed by the First Amendment. It doesn't mean you can use slander or libel tactics. That's a different story in itself. Now, just so you know, the people do not have this type of freedom in other countries that we take this freedom for granted. Because these two directors, you have one on the left, that's Sarush. I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. I apologize for any names being misspoken. And Malcolm Abaf on the right. Now, believe it or not, there are directors within even Iran that actually come in conflict with one another. Like you have Bam and Gobadi. It was 19 February 1st, 1969, in the Kurdistan province, Banay Kurdistan province. He left Iran for a disagreement he had with another director named Abbas Kirostami. For a film that was not given official permission by the government, he stated in a public letter, On what basis do you give yourself permission to ridicule the efforts of filmmakers to stand with the oppressed people using unacceptable words and, worse than that, speak with the same voice as religious dictators? Think about that. You have to get permission from the government to do a film. How many of you think that some of the films we like here in the United States, like the Jurassic Park series, would have had permission from the government? How about some of the Mortal Kombat films, even the web series? What about all the films, like you had The Passion of the Christ, you had The Gospel of John, The Son of God film? How many People think that would have actually been given the okay by the government. Just think if your government had to actually tell you, hey, you need my permission before you can do a film. That's almost how bad it was during the neo-realist times. When Mussolini walked out a film saying that this is not Italy. And you had these directors in Iran. They're a front to the government on this. They're like, why do you say that we can't do a film? And of course, two of these films where nobody knows and the push about, and nope, it's called Nobody Knows About the Persian Cast. That was in 2009. And it pretty much is about musicians trying to escape the censorship of the Iranian government. Now, of course, Abbas Kiro Stami, 
he created a film called In the Wind Will Carry Us. Now there are cut cutaways of common large group dialogue scenes where characters are bickering with one another. The balance around nature of the camera imitates the high energy of the characters in the scenes. Some of the films have been classified as postmodern, which is related to an era after modernism. Or it could be also related to or being any of various movements in reaction to modernism that are typically characterized by a return to traditional materials and forms, like in architecture, ironically self rivers and absurdity. When we look at literature, you can look at postmodern feminism if you want to. And of course, Darius Merju. Now, he was actually born in 1939 in Tehran, Iran. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from UCLA. This film he, he created was called The Cow. Now, the general synopsis of this film is that a man, he really loves his cow. He treats it like a dog. You can see him bathing the cow like it's like a dog you're giving a bath to. He actually gives the cow a kiss after kissing a puppy. And what happens is the man actually leaves. It doesn't tell us where he actually goes, but he loses his cow and ends up buying the spirit of the animal. And of course, there was banned for his portrayal of the dark imagery in the real section of Iranian society. Now, in 1971, it was smuggled into the Venice Film Festival. It became the main event. And many of these, film, these scenes are hand shot. And it has a shaky footage. You'll see... Like when the camera angles and everything is shaky, it gives support the emotions of the protagonist as he suffers to the grief of losing his beloved livestock, as well as lending to the barbarism to which he succumbs later in the film before his death. An initial presentation I did on this, there was actually clips I had on this. So I'm going to tell you about that actual film in itself. It's a powerful film because the guy, when he dies there, he actually jumps off a cliff and commits suicide. Now, that's a powerful topic in itself, but the guy does it in the film while he's in Iran. That was one of the reasons why the Iranian government did not like that film because it has suicide in it. Now, we're going to look at another film director called Saurabh Shahid Salis. He's also from Iran, Tehran, Iran. In 1998, he actually died in Chicago, Illinois. His family was a middle class. He actually has a large curriculum of taste. He worked in French cinema, German media, and of course, the Iranian New Wave. He created films for the Ministry of Culture and Arts. And he was actually forced to leave his country due to some of the fears film suggesting political messages that were disliked by the government. Just imagine your government doesn't like your films because it's political messages and they're kicking you out of your country. And what he viewed cinema was that it was an antagonism between man and society. And the role of it was to make conscious of indignity and inhumanity of life. In other words, cinema should tell about life. It shouldn't just be a fantasy. And this is where we sort of branch in with neorealism in Italian cinema. You saw actual real events going on, real life scenes. It wasn't doctored up like a lot of our films here today. We wouldn't call them like new way. We would call them about life. It's just a super cleaned up version of a false event. It's what our media has done. But look at the film Black and White he created. How about Still Life, 1974? Plot summary of that movie is that Mohammed Sardari works as a crossing guard at a train station while his wife sews daily and nightly. And of course, the life of the home and work is rather dry. We would call this almost like 
living the life of the early pilgrims in the cave over here. All you do is work hard all day and night, and there's nothing to life. That's why it's called still life. And then what about the movie A Simple Event? A 10-year-old boy in a small town with ill parents is trying to make a living smuggling fish. Which This has a similar background to the movie called Shusha, which is an Italian slang term for shoeshine. And even the film itself in English is translated to shoe shine. And that's about boys shining shoes. Later on, they're having to go to an actual boys' school where they do face some actual discipline abuse. Ultimately, one of the boys ends up dying in the end. What about the Far From Home movie? The Grim Light of the Turkish Guest Workers in Germany? Reifezeit? Look at some of these movies on IMDb. Now, today we, we probably hear about female directors, or we don't really look at female directors as because all we see is their name in a film. If we don't really think the name is feminine, then we get like confused and we find out, oh, it's a female director. Like I know there was one called Penelope Spears. I forget, I think she directed the actual Beverly Hillbillies movie, the newer one that came out about 20 years ago. But right in Iran, we would not assume females would have power to be a director of a movie, especially from some of the baby boomers. Like this one's called Rakshan Bani Etemad. 1954, she's born in Tehran, Iran. She was a film director, producer, and screenwriter. And then, of course, she had a BA in film studies from Dramatic Arts University in Tehran. That right there is interesting in itself. She's pioneered as the first lady of Iranian cinema. However, she rejects the title of being called a feminist film producer. Now, that's an interesting concept because she she's, is female. But she doesn't want to be known as a feminist film producer. Now, why is that? Simply, her main cause of concern is that universal struggle of lower classes in society regardless of gender. She's looking at the concept of struggle. That's what she's looking at. She's looking at the comp, the struggle of life. It doesn't matter about gender to her. Because she was born into a middle class family and they wanted to pursue an actual degree in teaching. It looks like she didn't want to do that. She wanted to portray the life. She was really, she should be one of the greatest women honored for being an actual pioneer of neorealism, the Iranian neorealism, or as we call Iranian cinema, or Iranian new wave. She created a film called Narjas in 1992. The movie tells the story of a love triangle in which a young man is led by two women. Adele, a thief, is led by Aging Afak. That's actually how it's pronounced, I believe. Also a thief. The story of the gang of thieves changes direction when Adele meets Narjas, a beautiful young girl from an impoverished family. Think about that for a concept. Usually thieves, we portray them as being actually poor people or impoverished. But he meets a girl from an impoverished family and he really, he actually falls in love with her. That's a powerful topic in itself. Now, let's compare the actual both with G neorealist cinema and Iranian New Wave. Neorealism was during the Mussolini regime. The films created over here were to give a false reputation of life. Meaning you can get away with making a film about Dante Alighieri's Inferno, Purgatorio, Paradiso. That was okay. But the directors said no. They wanted to show early for the truth. And of course, a good example, there's a controversial film called Ossessione, which was created by Lucchino Visconti, an actual aristocrat. This guy didn't have to make films. He loved making films, period. Now, Ossessioni 
It's actually based upon an actual, I believe it's an essay or an actual other movie called The Postman Always Wings Twice. Now, I'll say Sione, this in a nutshell. It is a love triangle film where you see that you have this drifter. He falls in, he's chased by an actual man from a truck, and then he actually goes inside this man's house. And he sees this beautiful woman. Well, that's the wife of the man who chased him in there. Throughout the film, you see this love triangle in there where the wife doesn't like the husband. To him, to her, he's really a slob. She does end up plotting his death in the film, of course. That's a controversial topic in itself, and it's very dark, the film. I recommend you watch it, because there's things offered in that film that you'll be able to point out quite easily compared to what was going on when that film was created, because that film was ahead for its time. And we look at the Islamic regime during that time. You couldn't show intimacy in the films. Now, I'm not saying you couldn't show, like, the sex scene from the first Terminator movie. That's, given without saying, that's beyond intimacy, that's sexual intimacy. But you couldn't even show a husband and wife. Even if they were married and acting in this film, you couldn't show any form of intimacy. It doesn't just mean, like, a kiss. You couldn't show that. Which is probably the reason why when the guy kisses up his cow in the movie The Cow, that's was probably raising a red flag right there. Probably holding hands, walking together. You couldn't see a lot of this. Stuff that we take for granted in our own cinema. You couldn't show. And of course, of course, the Khomeini regime condemned film watchers and placed strict codes on the directors. Think about Warren Jeff's actual beliefs. But the directors, they saw that film should be an art that should not be oppressed. Of course, the film I mentioned, Nargess, was considered an actual controversial film. And there's a lot of references for all this actual film. You can check them out if you want to, and you can do some of your own research. I sure hope you actually enjoyed the presentation. And that you took this long in class to present it.